Um, coming up, I'm doing a series of talks uh, about your relationship with God. And this is one of those talks that I want to give to you today. It's a talk about, I want to focus today on the subject of faith. And it's a very, very important subject to focus on, um, not only for ourselves who have already maybe heard a little bit about the divine love path, but also in terms of your discussions with other people and helping them see where you're coming from. It will help those kind of things quite a lot if they can see where you're coming from. So we'll get started on that subject, shall we? Okay. So you've had this fellow come along into your life um, through your law of attraction, by the way, <laughs> who, who says he's Jesus and says uh, a lot of things that nobody's really said before about, about, about the soul and other things. Now, some of the things, of course, you've heard before. Some of the things you've heard and have been present on the earth for hundreds and if not thousands of years. And then there's other things that are quite different that you've not heard before. And, and so you're listening to this material. And part of this material is you get presented to you that God is an entity. And many of us previously were probably thinking that God was a, some kind of energy field or energy force or just the whole universal love is God. Um, and so the concept that God is a, an entity, well, in the, in the end, is quite mind-blowing if you think about it because... How can an entity have created everything that we see on this planet, everything we see in the universe, everything that we see in the spiritual universes, all of those dimensional existences, there are currently 22 or so of them. How, how, do, how, do we, um, how can we even conceive that there's a person who actually put all that in place? That's a pretty big ask, isn't it, for many of us to even conceive that. So we'd prefer to believe that it's just an energy or some kind of thing without personality. But no, this guy who's come along who's saying that he's Jesus is saying that God is actually a, has personality, that God is an entity that has attributes and characteristics. And that in itself is a bit of a stretch. Some of us come from a background of religious background, like Christian religious background, and so we've always perhaps thought that God is an entity, but sp sometimes we've thought that God was three entities in one. Um, so even that's confronting to see God as just one single entity and that the three so-called three entities, Jesus, the second part of the, the, the Godhead, if you like, and the Holy Spirit, the third part of the Godhead, aren't a really a part of the Godhead at all. And so that's quite confronting for us to face up to. Anyway, on top of that, he says, this person that you've met says that you are a half of a soul and... And I'm purposely drawing them larger than God at this point because we've got to get some perspective. God's, for many of us, a long way away, so therefore quite small. <laughs> Isn't that the case? And, and we feel our life is very centric around ourselves. We were very self-reliant, so we, we're very connected with ourselves. And, and he's talked about how we've got this spirit body, which most of us at some point felt probably that we have, you know, and, and although many don't. And then... Um, we also have a material body, obviously. So we have all of these concepts presented. And then we start talking about concepts like how the soul unifies and all of those kind of concepts, which are all quite triggering. And then we start looking at the laws of God. We start looking at the law of attraction as it really is. And that's pretty different to what like, people like the secret and all those kind of things say it is. And then we look at the laws of desire and longing and how that affects everything. And we start, we start analysing all these things and we start seeing, in fact, that this soul has the ability to connect to God through a connection. So we start learning about that connection of longing for God's love. And we've started to grasp that, that we can actually long for God's love and have God's love enter us. And that actually transforms the soul into a new creature. And then we start realising that actually it's not quite as simple as what we read in the pageant messages in the sense that, you know, you just long for it and the love enters you and that's it. It's not quite <laughs> simple as that. The reason why it's not quite that simple is there's been people doing that for 40 years and they're still not at one with God. And yet in the first century I became at one with God in, by the time I was 30. So, so obviously if people have been doing it for 40 years, they've got to be doing something wrong. 
It makes sense, doesn't it? So we start learning about all of those things, but, but still there's something going on for us, you see, a lot of the times. There's still, we're still in this intellectual zone of going, hmm, that's all very interesting, you know? Yes, uh, you know, I can, I can feel some truths in it all, but there's, then I get confronted with some pretty harsh things that AJ says it feels like sometimes. Like, like one thing he says is that there's a whole group of things we've got to work on called morals. And we've got to work on this group of morals and, and down to the point where we can't even look at a woman without committing adultery with her. Like, whoa, like, like that's the opposite of what everyone else thinks. You can look as much as you like and you haven't done anything. Right? And then there's, you've got this guy saying, well, no, the way God's dealt with morals, the way the truth is about morals is that actually if you even look at something or have a feeling for something that's out of harmony with love, instantly there's a, there's a penalty on your soul. Now that's pretty confronting but, and hard to believe. I don't feel necessarily the penalty on my soul. It feels quite good when I walk along the street and look, look at all the women up and down. You know, I feel quite happy with that or you know, when I get out my porn magazine or whatever else. And so it's really... And then, then of course, like, yeah, you know, when it comes to taxation, we get triggered a bit, don't we? Like, yeah, we put in that. Oh, we didn't spend that, but we were allowed to get $500 back from that one, so we put that one down as well. And before you know it, you've got a lot of lies happening, and he's even saying to you, even the desire to lie is actually an immoral thing from God's perspective. Oh, geez, this is pretty hard now, like, isn't it? Like, pretty hard. But then, it, but then the funny thing is that it still feels like it resonates with me somehow, somewhere. And so, okay, okay, I'll go along to another session. And so you go along to another session and lo and behold he starts talking about these things called emotions, right? And it's just like, I've been in my head all my life and, and it's been fine up till now. And he's saying, <laughs> and he's saying I've got to connect with my emotions, he's, uh, that I've got to actually start allowing my true emotional state. And in fact he's saying many times that that actually what I think I'm feeling, I'm not even actually feeling. And I'm feeling something totally different. And, and I put up my hand and I say, ask a question. He says, instead of answering the damn question, he actually focuses on the emotional reason why I asked the question. <laughs> like, that's pretty confronting too. So, so, so he's talking about all these emotions and I, go, and I go away and I gel over that a bit, feel about that a bit. And I feel, you know, I still feel attracted to this, you know, it still feels truthful to me. But, I, but I'm not really certain about putting it all into practice yet or whatever. It just feels right, you know, there's something right about this. And so I go along to another session. And then you go along to another session, he starts talking about these things called desires. And he says that you have really a couple of different types of desires. There's addictive desires, which we discussed yesterday. And, and if I look at my whole life, most of my life's addictions, like, <laughs> far out. Like, you mean I've got to give up all of them? Like, like that doesn't, doesn't even feel fair. It doesn't even feel... You mean that somebody being angry with me and I get upset about it and I'm out of harmony? Like, how does that work, you know? So we have a lot of these kind of feelings about that coming up, right? But it's still, there's still this resonant thing going on inside of my soul going, yes still feels true for some reason, like I don't really understand but it still feels true. So then he starts talking about um, beliefs. And that they all have to come into harmony with God. Whoa, like, like I've got hundreds of them, hundreds of them that I was brought up with. Some of them are, are deeply cherished beliefs that I actually have. Like, I believe totally my mum loved me. That's a belief. And, and he's basically challenging even that, that, he, that my mum didn't even know how to love me, so how could she love me? Like he's challenging even that. And sure, sometimes there was a pure love coming from her, but sometimes it was neediness, control, and all these other things coming. And then on top of that, we've got all these beliefs about religious beliefs, you know, like, like I'm really attached to the idea of reincarnation. I really like it. And he's telling me it's not, you know, it's not how everybody's saying it is, that there is reincarnation, but it's not how everybody's saying. And, it, and, then, and then he starts talking about these things called spirits, like, 
like, sure, like, I know I have a spirit body and everything, and, but, but, you know, out of sight, out of mind. If you can't see them, then they can't be influencing you. That's what we think a lot of the time, don't we? And so, so and he's now saying, in, this is all in the mix as well. And all of these things, and then, you know, he starts talking about all the errors that are in. And then on top of that, after dealing with all that, he also wants me to change some things called truths inside of me. All right, so they've got to enter me as well. God's truths, I mean, not, not, our, not our own. And all of these things are a part of this desire or effect, the desire to connect to God. And all of these affect my relationship with God. Now, now I'm, I'm going by now, I'm going, geez, like, what started out a simple three things, which, was, which were have a longing for God's love, have a longing for God's truth, and feel all my emotions in humility, which all sounds pretty easy to do, really. Right? Sounds pretty simple to me. All of a sudden, there's all these aspects of it that, oh, it's not, those three things are like, they feel almost impossible now. <laughs> Particularly the third one, the one about being humble and feeling everything. And uh, that feels really, really difficult. And, and this person who's, and to top it off, the person saying he's Jesus, which how unbelievable is that, right? That's pretty unbelievable too, right? So, so on top of that, you've got this unbelievable person saying all these unbelievable things, but that are resonating with my soul. So am I crazy or what? That's what it feels like a lot of the time inside of ourselves, right? So all of these things are getting presented as truths, and obviously there are a lot more truths than this. You know, he's also talking about this thing being my soul. And my soul is not my spirit body, it's not my material body, it's not something actually that I can see, but I can feel all the time and I can live in it. And it's actually my soul condition that determines my level of happiness, not only on the planet here on earth, but also when we arrive in the spirit world and thereafter. And we can change our soul condition. Well, that's good news, like, but gee, it sounds pretty hard uh, already, right? And so there I am sitting with all this information. I've been listening now, let's say, for a year of it. Right? It's appealed to my soul that entire time and I've been listening to it for a year or maybe even two years, sometimes even three years or so. And sure, like, you know, AJ seems like a nice enough fella, but gee whiz, you get on the internet and there's a lot of people pretty angry with him. And they all bringing up all these past things that who knows whether they're true or not. You know, AJ's got his version. They've got their version. Who knows what really did happen, right? So here I am. I'm, you know, there's this lot of this stuff going on inside of me, and I'm still in my mind, really, in a lot of ways, trying to work through it all, trying to determine what's true, what isn't true. Do I do I practice this? Do I not practice it? You know, I feel drawn to it, and I've been longing for truth all of my life, and I feel drawn to it. But, but it, there also feels like a lot of problems with it to me as well. There's a lot of things that AJ says that I'd prefer to just go like, and just or let it go straight through and out the other end because, because in the end of the day, if, if I let it settle with me, there's heaps of emotions. For example, what about when AJ talks about abortion being a murder? Gee, that's pretty confronting. That, that means that sometimes half the women in an audience are murderesses and half the men with them who force them or coerce them into doing an abortion are too. Gee, that's pretty confronting. And then, but AJ doesn't seem to have any judgment about it. That seems to be a fairly good thing. But he is stating these things as truths. And I don't know whether they're God's truth or not, do I? Like, AJ seems to think he knows, but I don't know whether they're God's truth or not when I'm listening to it all. So how am I going to sort all this out, all this stuff out? How am I going to come to some kind of internal resolution of all of these things that, I've learnt, that I'm learning and continuing to learn? Well, the answer is by faith. And I'm not talking about faith in what I'm saying to you. I'm not even talking about faith in anyone else on this planet. I'm talking about faith in respect to one particular being and that is God. So the question we wanted to ask next is, 
what is faith in God? And how can faith in God help me sort out all of this stuff that I get bombarded with, not just from AJ when I come along to a seminar, but also from the whole world around me, you know? AJ says one thing on the weekend. I go around to, I saw, oh, I heard an interesting thing on the weekend. AJ said, da 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 da. Oh, AJ's an idiot. No, it's actually da 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 da. It's actually the opposite to what he's saying. Okay. How do I work out what's right? How do I work out which one version is the truth? I don't know. I don't know what's the truth at this point, do I? And I'm at least open enough to, to try to discover it, but gee, it just all seems too confusing. And it's this quality of faith that is going to sort all of that out for you. And that's why the quality of faith is such an important quality inside of yourself to develop. So what we want to do is identify what <coughs> faith is and how it actually it enables us to determine truth. And not only determine truth, because determining the truth is perhaps one of the least most important things in this pro process. The most important thing is that we act upon the truth. You know, you can intellectually determine truth. I say, yeah, that sounds good. That sounds like the truth to me. And you can even be very certain. You can say, no, I am certain that is the truth. But it's, that's a far cry from actually acting upon it and living it in your life. Well, you think about the, the truth of speaking the truth, for example. Like we often hear about speaking the truth. How many of us get upset when we're lied to? Well, the majority of us, don't we? Like get upset when we're lied to? And yet we lie to others quite constantly and think it's okay. Can you see there's a, some kind of thing called hypocrisy there? Where I'm perfectly happy with me lying to you, that's fine. But if you lie to me, you're in trouble. Right? And so we start saying, well actually inside of myself, I love hearing the truth from another person, but I hate having to tell it. <laughs> right? Now that's what, what's going to cause me to love hearing it and love telling it? And by the way, when I say love hearing it, as long as the truth is external to me, yeah, Joe Blow, he had an affair with somebody, somebody else and he left his wife, da, da, da. oh, that's good, you know, a bit of gossip, that felt good to hear, right? Truthful gossip, lovely. But when they're talking, they're talking about my life, <laughs> and discussing my life in the same way. Now I'm in a, you know, even if it is true, I'm not that happy about it. Does that make sense? And so here I am, I'm, I'm in this place where I'm expected to live in the truth 100% of the time if I want to connect to God. That's what, not, well, that's what AJ is telling me. AJ doesn't expect me to, but AJ is telling me that if I want to connect to God 100% of the time, I'm going to be 100% of the time in truth. And that's what he's telling me that God demands of me and if you could think of it as not God's demand, but God set up this universe, that that's the only possible way to connect to God. So in a way, it feels like a demand to me. It actually feels, now that I think about it, it feels like God's not that trustworthy, actually. God's pretty demanding, tries to make it pretty difficult to connect to God. So there's all these feelings and emotions that start coming up. Now, how do I even work my way through those? Well, AJ says you've got to feel every emotion and work your way through. AJ says, AJ says, AJ says, AJ says, you know, AJ this, AJ that, you know. And at the end of the day, what do we feel? We start getting into the stage where we're still in our intellect, we're still not really deciding to do what is suggested to us to connect to God. So how do I determine what, how do I, am I going to determine whether any of this is true or whether I should govern my life around it? And then on top of that, I look in the audience, you know, and there's some people who seem to be doing it. Like, you know, they're changing quite rapidly. I noticed that. You know, there's some people that before they were obnoxious as hell when I met them first, you know, but now they're pretty easy to get along with in comparison, you know. Before they always <laughs> demanding all the time and everything, and now they're quiet and mild and meek. And yeah, there's certainly changes that people are making, but who knows why they're making the changes? There's lots of reasons why a person can make changes. And then on top of that, we go down the line of it. Yeah, but some of the others in the group, you know, you know, we start having a spirit session and before you know it, they're flopping around on the ground. What's going on there? Like, like that's pretty strange. Like, you know, so that, that feels a bit unsettling inside of myself and I, I, I don't know 
Again, so all these things, are, you can see what's happening inside of myself. Inside of myself, I've got all these things which are, we call it look, the positive list. All these different things that are quite positive about what we're hearing. And then there's the negative list. And there's all these things that we feel are quite negative, but we're still fascinated, we're still drawn to the whole thing. But not yet able to get out of the doubt place enough to act. And it's only faith that will get you out of that place enough to act. And remember, I said it's not faith in what I'm saying to you. It's faith in God. And so that's why we want to specifically focus on the aspect of faith. So what is faith? Well, a long time ago, um, I talked... Uh, that question was asked to me quite frequently in the first century. And uh, I talk quite frequently about faith. None, none of the discussions that I had personally about faith um, are actually recorded in the Bible. But uh, through my connection that I had with the Apostle Paul while he was on earth, I managed to get a few definitions through him about faith. And, um, and he wrote them down and they're still recorded in the Bible actually, these definitions of faith. And there's two aspects of faith in particular that I'd like to mention to you. The first one is that faith is the assured expectation of the things you hope for. Let's just write that down. Assured expectation of the things hoped for. Now under that definition, uh, a person like, uh, a couple like the Wright brothers, for example, who designed the first flying aircraft uh, that was powered, as far as we're aware, um, they, they obviously had an assured expectation of their hope. Their hope was that with some kind of power and some kind of aerodynamic design that they come up with, that you would actually get you would actually get a heavy object off of the ground and it would fly. That's, that was what they hoped for. But they had some assurances that this was possible. Otherwise they wouldn't have even begun. Can you see, they, also, they could see that there were some gliders that people had made before then. And they, although they were not powered, they seemed to fly for short periods of time. They found that you could build a model, like a gl model glider, and you could throw it and it would fly. And sometimes it would pick up a thermal and actually go up. Um, and then other times, of course, that might not happen. Then they also watched things like birds and the way the birds had a curved structure of their wing where for some reason the top half was like this compared to the bottom. And, you know, there's something in that, you know. So they, they had some assurances and they found in that what happened was when the air flowed over, the air decreased its density as it flew over the top and underneath it compressed in density, which created a feeling of lift, right? And so they, they worked out all of those things and, and they designed their machine around the assurances that they had gotten from all these different avenues, from creation as well as from previous people before them. Does that make sense? But they still didn't know they could make something, well they, they still, from, a, from an external perspective, nobody said it was possible. But they believed it was possible, they hoped for it, but they also had some assurances that it was possible based upon what they had already observed. Can you see that? Can you see that faith isn't blind? It's based on previous truths that you've established. Okay? So that's the first part of faith and we'll talk more about that in relationship to God in a minute. The second part of faith is the, um, the evident demonstration of realities in 
though unseen. Okay, so what does that mean? Sounds like a bit of mumbo jumbo there. <laughs> All right. Let's think about the wind for a moment. The wind is not something you can actually see. But there is evident demonstration to you that it exists. Does that make sense? You can't actually see it with your eyes, but there are plenty other of other evidences that it exists. There is the evidence of the feeling sensation on your body and in your hair. So you get out in the wind and all of a sudden the hair is being blown back and you can feel the compression of the, of the wind on your face and all of that stuff is telling you that there's wind coming. This is what I call wind. It's, it's coming at me. I can't see it. But sometimes the wind gets even b bigger than that, stronger than that and all of a sudden it picks things up and those things come towards me. Like initially it might be a piece of paper and all of a sudden the wind and I see the piece of paper and it's swirling around exactly as the wind is flowing and bang it comes towards me and I can feel that wind has power. But I still can't see it. And in fact, right now, you cannot see wind. Now you can even design some, I some devices right, that are able to see wind because they look at things through compression and, and, and of, the, of the Earth's atmosphere and so forth and they can actually start measuring the fact that there is wind there. But you still can't see it. Do you see what I'm saying to you? There is plenty of the demonstration of evidence that wind is a reality, but you still can't see it. And to, to, to know that it is, that, that there are these realities, we have to use other senses other than the sense of sight. Can you see that? So the sense of sight in a lot of ways is not very powerful in our determination of truth. I'll give you another scientific example of that. Many of us on the planet believe that, the, uh, the, that there is such a thing called the atomic structure of things. So if you could zoom down into things, we go down, 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 we start exposing it, we start expanding it and go down, down into things. We start seeing things at the molecular level and then we go deeper, 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 deeper and all of a sudden we come up with things at the atomic level. And I've now started to discover using different instruments, still which you can't see from the human eye, the subatomic particles, that there's actually particles that are beyond, <coughs> below that level. Now, I can't even see anything at the molecular level except when there's billions of them. So I can see my body and I know it's a, it's a molecular structure of some kind, a, bio or, or a, a biodynamic structure of some kind, and I can see it and I can touch and feel it, but only because there's a billion cells in that arm that all merge into a function and form that I can actually physically touch and physically see. But if you get rid of all that, you can actually get down to the fact that you, you can put a thing on a microscope slide that you can't actually see with the human eye. And yet it's still there. So it's unseen. There's all this stuff that's unseen. There's literally billions of things, even on this planet, that are unseen. And yet I still believe they're there because I see the evidence, in the, uh, the reality demonstrated by the evidence. That's what I see. Does that make sense? Now, what I'm describing uh, is faith. That's faith. You have proof. Faith always has proof associated with it, always. Always has proof. Right? So there is no such thing, if we start talking about our relationship with God, there is actually no such thing as blind faith. Right? And whenever you hear the term faith, if you straight away think, oh, that means there's no evidence, then you're way out of line because it's totally the opposite to that. The faith is there because of the evidence. It's the, it's, it's the other way around to what most people think. 
They think, they think you have faith and then something happens. No, no, there's evidence and that creates your faith that something must be there. Now let's look at that towards God. Let's, let's focus, instead of focusing this towards the physical world that we see in, and let's start focusing towards God. What is the evidence? The evident demonstration of the reality. Let's look at the world. And people say, yeah, no, you, AJ, look at the world and that's proof that God doesn't exist. And I'm going, like, what? Let's separate the world that man has created from the world God created for a moment. So I can see for certain that many people would feel that the world that man has created, certainly there's not much evidence that God exists. And of course that is actually true because for most men and women on the planet there is no evidence of God and therefore the world they create is not going to have much evidence of God in it either. Does that make sense to you? But let's look at this other world, the world that existed that we can suppose from all of the history and the archaeological record and everything else, the world that, that existed before man came along. And let's look at that world. Well, there's remnants of it still around us, are there not? That's how we still live because there's trees that are still breathing that give us some air. So obviously there's remnants of that world that God created. Now let's look at that world, the world that God created, and let's just see whether there's any evidence that God exists. Shall we? Not only evidence that God exists, but evidence that God is good. Let's have a look at some of those things. Trees are amazing things, are they not? If you look at the functions of trees, what functions can you just think of off the top of your head that a tree actually has? Well, let's look at, say, the average tree. Um, most, most trees have fruit of some kind. So they have some kind of food for either animals, birds, or human life. Is that not the case? But most trees have fruit. What else do they have? Oh, they produce oxygen and then they live off carbon, um, carbon dioxide in the, in, the, in the night. And then during the day, through this process of photosynthesis, they create oxygen, which, by the way, every single person on this planet needs and every single living thing on the planet needs to live on. Right? So they produce oxygen as well. So now we've got two functions. We've got the, it, it provides food and oxygen. What are other functions? It provides home for most animals, birds, and even if we allow ourselves, when it's raining, what do we finish up doing generally when there's no other protection around? We go and run under a tree. So that produces shelter for lots of different animals, birds, creatures, and also for us as humans. If we cut it down, it produces fuel that actually we can use to heat anything we want. So it has that function too. It's highly insulation, it's got high insulation qualities. So we can use it to touch things that are hot without ourselves getting burned. Can you, can you see? Keep going. To build with, we can use it if it's dead. When it's alive, shade. It keeps all the soil in place so it manages erosion. Like, can you see now we're starting to get up to 10 just off the top of our head. There's literally hundreds of actual roles that a single tree has in your life. Right? Now, you think about that and you go, wow, like, how, did, how did that all come about? What does that tell me about God? Well, firstly, I don't know what it tells you, but it tells me that God is good, <coughs> that God is abundant, and that God has all of these different incredible designs that... And you know, there's not a single human yet that's replicated a tree. That's actually designed one from scratch and had it come alive. There will be in the future, actually. But at the moment, there hasn't been a single human yet on this planet who's done that. Aside from planting a seed, of course. But isn't a seed just an amazing thing? We get the fruit from the tree, and in that little tiny 
centre. Sometimes it's so small you can barely even pick it up with your own fingers. Like in the first century I used to refer to the mustard seed which grows into quite a large tree and yet it's a very, very tiny, little tiny round seed, isn't it? And, and like you can plant it in the ground and that little seed has a genetic code in it. Not only does it have a genetic code in it but for some reason as well it has life in it. And they've actually got some seeds from 2,000 or 3,000 years ago sitting in the pyramids and they've got that version of corn out, one seed, and planted it in the ground and two and a half, three thousand 3,000 years ago, as far as I know from carbon dating, it grows into a corn. That's that life and that genetic code locked in that seed now for 3,000 years. Like, and we, this is, we're only talking about one thing God created right here. We haven't even started on the human body, but let's not get started there. We'd be, we'd, we'd be going in a year's time still describing that, you know. And even then, we, no, no human on earth has ever come to understand the human body yet. You know, we're even trying to replace its parts at times, and we still don't understand how that works. And so, you know, we, we have a lot of struggle in understanding a lot of the things. But in all of that, it is, there's a lot of evidence demonstrated that there is a loving force behind all of those things. A force that's in interested in symbiosis. A force that's interested in cooperation between all sorts of things and all sorts of species, plants, birds, animals, all insects right down. So let's look at the humble fly for a moment. Right. Its eye is such an in intricate thing, is it not? Like, it can see almost everywhere around itself. Like, it's like it's got eyes in the back of its head, literally. Because you go up behind the fly, and you're trying to touch the fly just softly, you know. You get up so close, and it's just like, off it goes. And then and we think, oh, what a pest, you know. So we get out the mortine and, you know, and spray it out. And for those overseas, mortine is like an insecticide. And then, and sort of... You spray it out and it dies, but we don't understand what we're killing really, even. Because without the fly, we would be full we would be waist deep in waste. Without the fly. Like and everything would stink to high heaven without it. So it's this beautiful garbage warrior. <laughs> that looks after all of that for us. And God's created all of these beautiful things that clean up the planet. So us, the human, is perhaps the most polluting being on the planet. We are the most polluting being on the planet, are we not? And we've got all these things cleaning up after us automatically so that we don't have to do it. Right? And then, you know, we go into the insect world and we go, gee, like a lot of the insects seem to be a bit pointless, but you know, without the insects, none of us would actually be alive right now because there'd be no food. Because food happens through pollination and pollination happens through insects. I don't see any of you going out to your garden, <laughs> uh, putting, although some of you do, I notice, with the bigger trees, but, but with, your, you know, with, your veg with your vegetables and your fruit, very rare to go out and, go and pick a little bit of pollen off of one and put it on the other. <laughs> And that's how you have to make your... It all happens for you. Like, when have you made something that all happens for somebody else? Everything happens and they don't have to do a thing. And God does that for us. And not only does it, does it, but does it in abundance. Like, one tree... You plant one fruit tree. Most of the time, like, you get 500, 1,000 pieces of fruit off of it. So much that you, you know, you're there stewing it, you're stewing it at night, <laughs> stewing it the next night, because you can't eat it all. It all drops on the ground and you think, oh, that's a waste. It's not a waste because all these insects love that and all these birds love that and everything, but we think it's a waste, of course, because anything that's not going inside of me is a waste. <laughs> and, and, and so what we do is we, we then believe, right, that, that uh, yeah, no, you know, we have this feeling inside of us that it's all happening, but we don't even think about it. We don't even ponder about it most of the time, do we? And unfortunately, what man has created actually removes us from it. Because where do you get your fruit from again? Oh, yeah, that's right, down the shop. 
you know. Where do you, where do you get your milk from? Oh, down the shop in a container, you know. Everything is removed from its point of origin. So much so that what it does is it helps us forget where it came from. Right? Now, but all of these things are a demonstration of the reality that someone cares for you. Every single moment. Not only that, that someone cares for you, but that someone is abundantly caring for you. You don't have to plant 500 trees to get 500 pieces of fruit. You only have to plant one tree and you get 500 pieces of fruit. And not only that, you get so much fruit that it's too much for you, too much for your neighbour, too much for your friends, and you let some of it drop on the ground and the insects and animals eat that. And then not only that, after that, there's still some seeds left over that you can plant another tree and have another tree grow that has 500 pieces of fruit. That's how much abundance God's got given to me. There's evident demonstration of the abundance of whoever created all of this. And then people say to me, but... Oh, AJ, you keep saying creator. There's no such thing as a creator. You know, it's just evolution, man. You know, like it all just come about. I go, wow. Like, is that that's a really logical premise? I feel. Like, <laughs> you know, once myself and Mary we were sitting outside looking at our car, the newly purchased <laughs> car that we got a year or two ago, and we were just sitting outside, and, and we were talking about God, and I said. Babe, look at that car, like, it's pretty ugly in the end. Um, it's functional, it works. It's got how many per parts? Do, does anyone know how many parts are in the average car? I think there's about 30,000 or 50,000, something like that, the average car has got, you know, if you count all the nuts and bolts and all of the washers and everything else. Anyway, it's got 50,000 parts and yet if I told you that that car arrived on my driveway just out of thin air, all of you would laugh at me, right? There's no, I doubt whether there's anybody to say, AJ, yeah, I believe you. <laughs> right? And yet I can sit and watch the tree next to the car which has thousands and thousands of things going on it with anyone, and it's alive on top of that. It actually lives produces all of these symbiotic things that I need as well. And I can say, yeah, no, that tree come around by itself. Like, where, where's the evidence? Where does the evidence point me? Well, the evidence points me to the fact that if, if my car had a designer, then that tree, which is infinitely more complex than the car, and on top of that, it's alive, it thinks for itself and does the job for itself without anybody doing it for it, Whereas in the car, I've got to drive the thing. Like, it can't think for itself. It can't go along. You imagine driving along the road and, you, and, and, and in the future, we may have a car that does this. I don't know, but, but uh, I don't think so. I think uh, it's, the complexity of it is too great. When you, when you think about how many thoughts pass through your mind at any given time and how many physiological functions are being controlled by your body at any point in time, and you're going along in the car and you say, oh, I feel like going left now. You know, and the car goes left. Well, that's quite simple. I feel like going right now, and the car goes right. But what happens, I want to tailgate this person 10 metres behind. Like, well, that's quite manageable nowadays with some sensory equipment. We can add that to the car. And what happens all of a sudden if somebody makes a decision four cars ahead? Well, that's a bit harder, isn't it? Like, I can see with this eye is this beautiful thing my body is being created with. I can see way, way into the distance, and particularly if I've got those on because mine obviously are affected by something emotionally. And, and I can see way in the distance and I can see that car, actually that car's got its brakes lights on and something's up there happening. Oh, I'm going to slow down now. I'll make the decision now. I can preempt things. Then, then let's even go a bit further than that. Do you know they've done tests where they've separated a child, a baby, from its mother who's, who is still breastfeeding its child and when the child cries for a feed, only for a feed, and for no other reason, the mother's breasts start lactating. Right? Now, that's something going on, isn't it? That's an evident demonstration of a reality that I can't see. We've got proof that it's happening, but we don't know how it happens. It could be anything that goes on in between that, but something's going on. And then they've done other tests you know, between owners of dogs and, their, and the dog and their owner. 
You know, the dog runs to the door when the owner, five kilometres away, comes home, decides he's going to come home from work. And then the owner comes home from work at a different time and the dog goes, at the same time, the owner is going home from work then. It's not like it's a learned response. There's something between the dog and the owner going on. Who knows what that is, but there's evident demonstration of reality, though we can't see it. So, so can you see in the end, the majority of things that happen in our day-to-day -day life are actually based on faith. Almost everything that happens in your life today, you believe is going to continue to happen. You believe the sun's going to continue to come up and go down. And we say, oh yeah, but that's because of a law. But you can't see that law in operation, can you? Can you see gravity? Like, well, we can only see the evident demonstration of gravity. Because when I pick up something and I put it over a gap and I let go of it, it always goes down. That's the evident demonstration of the reality that there must be a force there pulling it down. And if that's the case, then I can't see it. So why am I addicted to everything I can see? So any person who ever says to you that they only believe what they can see is one of the most stupid idiots on the planet, really. <laughs> it is, isn't it? Because it's not true for a start. They're, li they're lying to themselves. They do not even believe that themselves. And actually, they're telling you what, what is the condition of their emotional state rather than the real condition of their own life in reality. Because their own life in reality, they trust things they can't see every single day. You imagine them going out the car, starting up the car, you know, put it in gear, drive up the hill, and you get to the top of the hill and all of a sudden it just keeps going. <laughs> like, oh, I forgot to turn on the gravity today, you know, like, you know. And, and they trust that the hill goes over the end and they're going to go over the end too. That, that's what they trust, do they not? And they trust that with their whole life. And I know it sounds strange, but it's true. They're trusting that with their entire life. They're betting their entire life on something they cannot see every single day of their life. And what about with an aeroplane? Yeah, now they're trusting two things they can't see at the same time, gravity and aerodynamics. Right? And a lot of times we're actually trusting 10 or 15 or 20 things we can't see at the same time. And yet we're going along saying, oh, I only trust everything that I can see. How logical is that? It's not true. It's just totally false. We are always trusting lots of things we can't see at any one point in time. So let's get back to the definition. So we can see in the case of all of these evidences on the planet, we can see that there is a lot of things going on behind the scenes and we are assured, we have assured expectations all the time in our life. You have the assured expectation you are not going to fly off this planet. Right? And that is an assured expectation you have at every single moment. It's so sure for you that you don't even contemplate or think about it the majority of the time. That's how sure it is. You don't even consider it because it's so sure. And we have the evidence demonstrated that although we can't see a lot of the things, we are in fact at every single moment of our life trusting a whole gamut of things that we can't see. That's what we're assured of. So now let's apply this avenue. So this is what faith is. So let's apply this faith now to this, our relationship with God. You see, there is plenty of evidence on this planet right in front of you, in your own body right in front of you, every single moment of every single day that God exists. And not only that God exists, but also that God is good. Right? 
and not only that God is good, but that God desires to care for you. And we can see evidence of this all around us. And this is the basis of your faith. This can form the basis of your faith. See, if you allow yourself to contemplate about it, you can see all of these things happening around you. Now, we have some faith, actually, that there is a good God that exists, is, is, that has personality. I can see personality in the creation, can I not? You just watch a rainbow a lorikeet that comes and sits outside of your ledge on the evening before it goes to roost. And you can see some personality there, can't you, in one of God's creations. And not only that, when they fly together, you notice not so much the rainbow lorikeets, but other birds that are flocking birds, how one of them changes, but they all seem to change at the same time. It's like they're connected by some kind of invisible force, right, that just causes them to change all at the same time. And yet... When we look at our physiological response between the mind and the brain and us reacting, there's usually, a th uh, usually about a third to one-sixth of a second that it takes us to respond. Now, if that was the case, you'd have one, one bird responding and then a third second later, another one responding. And by the time the millionth bird at the end got to respond, we're talking like, you know, 25 days later, you know, the last <laughs> bird turns. That's what would be happening if it was all due to some kind of physical thing. So there's obviously something. Right? So here I am, I'm thinking about all those things and I'm now, what I now need to do is go into myself a little and allow myself to ponder about God and how I can see God in all these things. The fact that God, the, and not only just God that God exists, but God's nature. Allow myself to feel about God's nature. Now, I'll be giving a talk later about God's nature and attributes and, and demonstrating to you through creation what are some of God's, nature, uh, some of God's nature and attributes. So I don't want to spend a lot of time on that today. What I want to spend time on today is focusing on this quality of faith with you right? and how we can read these na this nature and attributes and actually it finish up being something that we can determine our relationship with God to be. Am I going on and off again? So, let's look at this, this quality of faith in regards to the nature of God. I can see from the universe around me, not only from my body, I can see from my body, from the things, trees, animals, birds, insects, all living creatures and a lot of the non-living things around me. I can see the nature and personality that there is a God that exists and a God who cares for me. And all I need to do is have some logic about it. That's all I need to do. So I have this logical feeling that God exists. It's, and it's logic because it's based on the premises of evidence. It's not something that is like there's no evidence for. This is why like people like who are well renowned pe world renowned people in history who are scientists mo many of them believe in God. Right? <coughs> now nowadays a lot of people feel that that's not true, but the truth is that when someone like Einstein for example, if you talk to him in the spirit world which many of you have the opportunity of doing if you wish to, you would find that actually when he was on earth, he believed in God. Not God as a loving being with energy, but God as an entity with energy and with power. And he's always felt that God was a God of love. He's one of your celestial brothers. And, bro brothers. and there are many people like, who passed in the spirit world who learned soon after passing, for the first time actually, that there was so much evidence on the planet that God exists that they just ignored it all because of an emotional reason. What are the emotional reasons? Well, what we do, and this is a big trait of the human family, is we, we instead of separating what God has created from what mankind has created and then judge God by what God has created, what we do is we put it all together and then judge God by what man has created. 
And there's a lot of flawed reasoning in that. If you listen to almost any argument of any person who presents the argument of atheism, you'll find that they eventually, at some point, get back to religion. And really, their emotional issue is not with God, but actually with religion, in most cases. And, and this is the case also with many scientists. If you start discussing the aspect of God with many scientists, in the end, many times it does get back to, again, a discussion about religion and the concepts of religion on the planet. And the concepts of religion, as we've been discussing in the past, are very flawed and have no logic in them and, by the way, have no faith in them either. Because remember, faith is the evident demonstration of reality, though we can't see it. And faith is the assured expectation of things hoped for. Religions don't have that because they're trying to assure you about things that don't even exist. So, you know, there's no faith in them. Right? Real faith comes from evidence backed by proof. So here I have my heavenly parent, God. And I'm desiring to understand whether all these things AJ is saying about this God are true. So how do I go about actually finding out whether they're true? And here's me. Now, from a logical perspective, it would make most sense to connect with the person who created something to find out the truth of it, wouldn't it? So, so you know, outside I've got my Commodore wagon that I drive. Now, if I wanted to fix that Commodore wagon, it would be better if I went and got a manual that was made by the Commodore, you know, the Holden people, and with a description of every part and all those things in it, and now I have the ability, if I learn about all that, uh, to fix that wagon, do I not? You imagine trying to do it by trial and error without any knowledge whatsoever. You imagine that. Imagine for a moment, you drive along a car and all the goes, it stops, you know. And you've got no idea about how a car operates whatsoever. Now, many of us now are in that boat, aren't we not? And what do we do? We sit up and ring the RAA or the RACQ you have here, isn't it? And then and they come and do their, do their thing, you know. But for the majority of us, we don't understand how the engine actually operates. But some of you do understand how it operates. And they're totally capable of fixing that engine itself. But imagine trying to do that without knowing. It, it would be pretty difficult, wouldn't it? What would you have to do? What you have to do is make one minute change, test that, and make another minute change, test that, make another minute change. And in a car alone, there are literally millions of things you can change, just minutely. So there are millions of times you can change something. So that means you're going to have to test it. That's 999,654 times that I've tested that. That still didn't work. Go for the next time, test that, and test that, and test that, and test that. You can see this process is going to take quite some time. Can you not? And this is what we finish up doing with God. We say, all right, I'm going to throw out the manuals. And there is one manual that God can give to all of you, and we'll talk about that. But we throw out the manuals, and what we do instead is we try to discover everything through, try, through what we call scientific method. It's, it's the least possible scientific method you could ever come up with, trust me. Why is it the least possible scientific method? Because the most scientific method, if you think of it from a logical perspective, is to actually connect to the person who created the thing that you're trying to affect and then get a download of what they think about it. And now that, that's the most rapid and most logical and scientific thing you could do. Now let's look at the least scientific thing you could do. The least scientific thing you could do, which is now what is pretty much described as the scientific method on the planet, is you set up an experiment to test a certain thing. You test a certain thing and, oh, it didn't work. So you then make some assumptions and then you make another experiment. And then 
And of course you need huge amounts of money to do this because nobody wants to do this for free, of course. Well, why would you want to do it for free? It's like it could take you 60 years to do something like this. And in fact, in the spirit world, right as we speak, there are still scientists who don't believe in God, who are still experimenting with creation in order to discover how it all works. Right? And they have spent hundreds and hundreds, many of them, of years with millions of experiments, with quite a few hundred thousand of them people-wise, trying to discover certain truths. When the most logical thing to do is just talk to the person who made it. But you see, what we go down the track of, we say, oh, it's not possible to talk to the person who made it. That's what we think, right? And because it's not possible, we now have to discover it. We have to experiment with it. But experimentation is the most long-winded way to discover any truth, isn't it? Why, why would you want to do that? Surely we want the fast-track way to truth instead of this constantly drawn-out experimentation process. So what we have historically on the planet is we have these things called religions. And these things called religions have made what they feel are many experiments and come up with what they believe is the definition of God. Now, let's, say, let's look at some of the experiments. One of the experiments that they did years ago, and I'm talking now like three and a bit thousand years ago, was they'd have a child, and because it was the first of their children, and because they believed that God was a, a, was a God who would punish them, they burnt their child alive in a sacrifice. And they found that whenever they did that, the next crop that they had was actually better. What? Yeah, that's what they found. And m many of them did, that, uh, did, did quite a bit of experiments with that and found that that was the case, that their life actually went better if they did that. How does that work? Right. And who would even conceive of that experiment? And, you know, of course there are literally hundreds of possible answers as to why that occurred. The most logical one being that there's some angry person who was probably some kind of person who passed before them, who's angry, and who needs appeasement. And whenever you appease him, he gives you a reward. And whenever you don't appease him, he takes something away from you. And that could be your own dad who was like that when he was on earth and before he passed. That's quite logical. But no, no, we don't go down that track. What we do is we say that God is like that, that God does this reward and punishment system. When literally there are like six billion spirits at least right at this moment who do this reward and punishment system with you right now. Right? That's how they work. They are in the spirit world, in the hells of the spirit world, Reward, punishment, reward, punishment. For whenever they get their addiction met, there's a reward. Whenever they don't get their addiction met, there's a punishment. And they're working with you right now with that. So it makes sense, of course, that years ago they would probably do the same thing. But instead what we do is we judge it all and we go, no, no, that's God. Can you see what we do with God? We basically say that God is a human. But not only just a human. We basically get the worst of the humans that we ourselves, right at this day, put in jail for doing what they do, and we say that God is worse than the worst of one of those. Because if we actually believe that God is a punishing God, then that means that every single person who dies on this planet got punished by God. Now, God's a pretty big murderer, if that's the case. Because how many people die every day? I think it's quite a few million, isn't it? Die every day. Yeah, he's the murderer largest possible scale if that's the truth uh, but what we do what we do is we make all of these assumptions and then, then we go down the track of judging God but there's plenty of evidence that God is not like that because if you take away man's creation and put it to the side for a moment and you just focus on God's creation itself only then you can see all the evidence of these of beauty and symbiosis in that but the problem is too that man is so involved in God's creation now 
that we are also affecting God's creation, and that, of course, makes logical sense. Scientists have recently found out that whenever you observe something even, you change it. It's one of the laws uh, revolving around this aspect of, of uh, <coughs> physics. And they see that if you actually observe it, you can change something from one thing to another thing just by the observation of it. And if you don't observe it, nothing changes. As soon as you observe it, and I'm going on and off again, as soon as you observe it, things, things change. And that's the trouble with what we do here on the planet. What we do on the planet is we say, yeah, see, you know when AJ talks about eating meat, for example, and then we look at the animals and you say, they eat meat. So AJ's wrong about that. God's created it to eat meat. Well, that's a far stretch, going from animals eat meat so God created them to eat meat. And what kind of meat did he create them to eat? Did he create them to eat alive meat or dead meat? <laughs> There's a big difference between those two things too, isn't there? Like one of them I've got to slit the throat of, the other one has just died naturally. There's a, a very big difference between those two conditions. So I'm there judging it and I'm saying, no, animals, they, you know, they kill food, they eat food, they eat the meat. So, so that is justification for me to be like the animal. Like the average kangaroo in Australia um, has um, quite a number of women, <laughs> doesn't he? Like there's one male usually and then there's five or six females hanging about him and he impregnates all of them. So that's a great excuse for a male on the planet, a human male on the planet, to have five or six women at the same time, isn't it? Can you see what we do? We actually think that the animals are like they are because, and we can copy them, and in reality the animals are like they are because they're copying us. And there's a logic in that, isn't there? But nobody ever considers that logic. Like they all think the opposite is the most logical thing, that the animals do what they do because, and we can copy the animals because we're allowed to. But the real logic might be the, to completely the opposite, and that is that the animals are doing what they're doing because the humans do it. That could also be true, couldn't it? We're doing what they're doing be because we've chosen to. What could, what, couldn't it be the opposite to that? Of course it could. But of course none of us want to consider that because that would be too confronting. That would be too confronting. It would mean that we'd have to change to become more pure and loving. And oftentimes we don't want to do that. So what we do instead is we justify our behaviour through what we see, understanding that actually what we see is a direct reflection of our behaviour. Right? And so in this, in this relationship with God, what I'm starting to do is to, starting to see that actually what God creates is completely trustworthy, is, is able to be trusted. We can have faith in everything that God has created. We can even have faith in God's nature that God is beautiful, kind, loving, just, because we can see all of these things happening in nature when it's taken out of the influence of mankind, right? And so what we do is we start looking at God from a different perspective. We start seeing that we actually can have faith that God is good. And do you know what is the biggest impediment to your own progression right now? It's that your faith that God is good is not strong enough. In the first century I said if you have the faith the size of a mustard grain, you will move mountains. Right? And I meant that literally as well as figuratively. So often what happens is our faith in God is very minute and part of the things that we need to grow and pray about is growing our faith. And one of the ways we can grow our faith is by looking at all the things that God has done for us, to us, and also to the world, and all the laws and all the principles and everything. Look at all of those beautiful things God has done and start attributing it to God's personality and nature instead of assuming that God somehow has changed with his interaction with me. Right? God doesn't change in his interaction with you. All we're doing is we're looking at things through our different coloured glasses instead. 
So here is God. God is there waiting for us to have a relationship with her. And we need to start developing faith that this relationship is possible. We have evidence that it's possible, even. But of course we also do what we often do with all the other evidences and we discount it. Right? We easily dismiss it. Now, what evidence do we have? Well, there's lots. Now, how much paneling has been done now in front of you? Well, there's a person talking to somebody in the spirit world and, uh, and they've got different personality, different attributes, different qualities and some of them are connected to God and they seem to be quite happy and other ones of them are disconnected from God and they seem quite sad and depressed and down and alone. And then when you take those ones who are depressed and down and alone and sad and you start talking to them about connecting to God and longing for love, they actually describe to you how there's this thing entering them that brightens them up that they actually can describe to you happening at the time. But, of course, for me to ignore all of that, I have to ignore, I have to say, oh, no, that medium's just a nutcase, you know, who knows? And they're just going by their belief system. Monica and myself did a little bit of channeling this morning with a group of army um, commanders from the first century who were in the hills. And anybody, we were doing it privately, there was no one else there, and it is recorded and we will put it on the internet at a later time. But um, anybody listening to that could just automatically assume that firstly AJ's a nutcase for thinking he's talking to somebody when he's not. Monica's a nutcase for thinking she's actually hearing somebody that she's not. And that makes two of us being a nutcase. And then on top of that, all those people who see spirits and describe them to you, they're all crazy too. Right? Can you see what we do? Can you see why there's schizophrenia? What we, do, what we do now is we label the disease and we give it a name called schizophrenia of people who see and hear voices, see spirits and hear voices. They are crazy, we say. But there's plenty of evidence they're not crazy. You start talking to them and they'll even tell you the date, time of somebody's death that they're talking to. Today it was the name of the person and who he was and where he existed and when, which could easily be traced. Right? And there's literally, with mediums, there's literally thousands and thousands of examples available to any person who's willing to see that there are actually people who will give you the date and the time of their death. In the pageant messages, when you read them, you can actually read the date, the time of a person's death and where they came from and everything. And if you investigate, you'll find that these are real people, real people who have died talking to somebody on earth and there's plenty of evidence but just a lot of people don't want to believe it so they'd rather say oh they're crazy this person's crazy that person's crazy but the evidence is just like hitting them in the face there are actual people who lived who are talking to you where are they talking to you from and they describe how it feels to have divine love entering them so so what does that tell you there's all this evidence, evidence there that God exists, God is good and that God wants a personal connection with you. Does that make sense? So, this avenue of faith means that I can then start myself to change. And what I would like to do, if we have a break now or shortly, what I want to do after the break is talk about how this faith in God herself can actually affect your life and cause you to take action. Because for many of us still, we are not taking the action we could take if we really had faith, that we would take if we really had faith. You see, if you really had faith, and this is the greatest incredible being of the universe who created you, and you really had faith that she existed and you really had faith that she was good, would you not want to connect with her? And would you not want to connect with her as your highest priority in your life rather than, you know, something you do on a Sunday? Right? Sort of like, I, uh, seven, six days a week what I'm going to do is use the scientific method 
And then the seventh day of the week, oh, I think I'll connect with God today and see what I get. Wouldn't it, wouldn't it be better to do the other way around? Like six and a half days a week, use the God method, and on the Sunday have a rest and the, the other way around and see what happens. It would make more sense because at the end of the day, this being wishes to connect with you. She is your mum and he is your father and wants to connect with you. And if you really had faith about that, and there is plenty of evidence this being exists, by the way, and there's plenty of evidence this being is good, and there's plenty of evidence this being loves you, and there's plenty of evidence that you can even discover for yourself just by acting upon the evidence. You don't even have to believe anything AJ says to you, actually. What you can do is you can experiment with it for a year. Isn't it worth a year of your life to experiment with? Like, for example, you're pr totally willing to experiment with a year on a, re on a relationship and then find a year later that she was the wrong one or he was the wrong one for you. Right? And yet you're not totally willing to experiment for a year of your life with your relationship with the being in the universe that can tell you why your relationship went wrong. <laughs> does that make much sense? It doesn't, does it? When you think about it logically. So, so what we want to do, and we'll, do, if we'll focus on this after the break, is what can the things that we need to do here, this is our soul, this is me, what I can do that is affected by my faith that will cause me to act. Because the truth is that if there is no action, then there is no faith. And in the Bible, uh, my brother um, made this statement. My brother James, he made this statement. He was my brother from Earth, the first century. And the statement was that faith without works is dead. So you can, claim, you can come along here day after day, week after week, month after month, and listen to all this stuff. None of it is going to benefit you until you have the faith that you can experiment with it for a period of time and see whether it works. Anybody can do that. A child can do it, so anybody else can do it. Right? We can experiment with it and see whether it works. But the problem is, is, you know what we want here in our minds most of the time? What we want to do instead of that is we want to have, have someone in front of us do it and then we'll say, oh, now there's evidence, so I can do it. Well, you know what happened in the first century to me? I was that person in front of them doing it. And still nobody wanted to do it. So it's got nothing to do with somebody being in front of you doing it. It's got everything to do with whether you want a relationship with God or not. That's what it's got everything to do with. How much do you want it? Do you want to spend the rest of your life experimenting using the scientific method right, of trial and error all the way through your life or would you like to do it a lot easier than that and actually start looking at the truths that have been presented but now putting them into action personally, applying them personally, having a desire to put these things into action in a way that causes change in your life instantly. And that's the thing we need to decide. And if I can just illustrate before we go to a break, there's one, one thing and that is let me look at the avenue of truth for a moment. I have presented to you over and over again how important truth is to your relationship with God, your relationship with yourself and your relationship with others. I have said to you that without truth, without being completely open and honest and truthful, with every single person in your surroundings, you are not going to ever get to be connected with God completely. And yet how many of us still avoid saying the truth even of what we feel to another person, even to the person who's closest to us, our partner? So we walk along the street, we checked out that woman there, our partner's right next to us, we don't turn to our partner right at that moment and say, oh, I just checked out another woman. Or I'm the woman in the relationship walking along the road and, and, and right next to my man and I'm watching the bottom of the man in front of me. And I don't turn to the man that's 
I've got, my, I've got my arm around and say, I'm just watching his bottom. Right? That's the level of truth. Right? Now, how do, I have, how do I know that that level of truth is required to be connected with God? By experiment. You try connecting to God for a month without telling the truth to anyone. You, you try maybe maybe making a few lies to somebody over the month and just seeing how that goes with your connection with God. You try that, and then the next month what you do for the whole month is you tell everyone the truth and see what happens. You experiment with it, right? That's what you do. And experiment with your relationship with longing for God's love as you're doing it. So you still long for God's love while you're in the month where you're lying to everybody or not telling the truth or withholding the truth, right? For a month... You withhold all the truth from everybody. You don't tell them a single thing. At the end of the month, by the way, you're going to feel quite bad inside of yourself. But, but, but that's fine. It's an experiment. You're allowed to feel bad inside of yourself to work out the truth. So experiment with it. How do you feel inside of yourself after the month of not telling the truth? How do you feel inside of yourself after the month of telling the truth? How do you feel inside of yourself with your connection with God with the month you're not telling the truth? And how do you feel about your connection with God when you're telling the truth? How do you feel people respond to you when you're not telling the truth? How do you feel they respond to you when you're telling the truth? You can measure every one of those things. You just have one month on, one month off of truth and give it a go. Right? Or you can just trust <laughs> that telling the truth is the way to go because it feels right inside of yourself anyway and just do it from now on 100% of the time. In other words, act upon your faith. Right? You can do that too. But either way, you can build your faith just by experimentation as well. And it makes logical sense, doesn't it, to do it that way. The reason why there are just as many men coming along generally, and uh, this audience is probably more women than men, but not by long, not by much, the reason why there's just as many women as men generally that are attracted to the divine truth compared to other things is that the divine truth makes a lot of logical sense. Right? And the reason why there's many women attracted to it because the divine truth also makes a lot of emotional sense. Right? Does it not? So, so the beauty of it is we can experiment with all of these different truths and we can find out whether they're true or not. But you're not going to find out they're true with, by just thinking about them. Because thinking about them proves nothing. You become a philosophizer. That's all you do. Like, there are universities full of philosophizers who don't know any truth. <laughs> there are, aren't they? They'll philosophize about this, philosophize about that, you know, all these different ideas. And in the end... You ask them what they personally believe and they will say to you in the majority of cases, I've got no idea. Because actually, philosophizing doesn't help you determine truth. Right? And these are all truths that can easily be proven and all we need to do is start allowing ourselves to feel our way through the process and act upon what we've learned. So what we'll do after the break is we'll focus on this aspect of faith and how it can drive us into action rather than us sitting on our backsides listening to everything but having no, nothing that we act upon. We can't expect to determine the truth by sitting down and hearing it only. I also said in the first century that you, if you feel you can do that, you are just deceiving yourself with false reasoning. Because what we're doing is we're waiting, 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 waiting. Yeah, more truth, more truth, more truth, more truth, more truth. We're waiting, 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 waiting. We're thinking that actually we can think ourselves into a state. You're not going to be able to think yourselves into a one with God. You're going to have to act at some point. Right? And make changes in your life at some point and feel emotions at some point if you want to be at one with God. You can't think yourself into it. You, and if you think you can, you're just deceiving yourself with some false reasoning. Does that make sense to you? When have you ever been able to think yourself into something when you think about it? <laughs> <laughs> so, I'm, 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 a bit of an oxymoron there, but anyway. 
so you, you sit down, you know, in your couch at night. <sighs> yep, and uh, tomorrow I think I'll buy a house, you know. Yeah, okay. You know, and so you go to sleep and you imagine yourself buying the house and you set up your desire to buy the house and everything. And the next day you haven't done anything and you, yep, today I should have bought a house, but I don't know what happened. It didn't just seem to come to me for some reason. So you do the same thing. You know, for a hundred years you can do that and you're still probably not going to buy a house. Because under the current situation, you've actually got to sign a piece of paper when you buy a house. <laughs> you've even got to do that. Like, you've got to have some action. You've got to take some action. And you see, we're so used to taking action in our day-to-day -day lives about things that really are of little matter to us. But we are so used to avoiding the biggest possible area of our life, which is our connection with God and our connection with ourselves, we are so used to avoiding that with no action whatsoever. We don't want to take action on that whatsoever. So, so can you see that faith is going to be required, where I'm going to need to have faith that if I take action, I may get the result that I'm actually looking for. But one of the biggest injuries we have on this planet, unfortunately, is that the majority of us have been hurt so much from taking action that ended up nowhere. Right? We have so much grief about that, where we tried our hardest in a relationship, for example, and it failed. Or we tried our hardest to have a child and we never had one. Or we try, tried our hardest to get a good job and we're only in this like cleaning job that we feel is not is pretty pointless or we tried our hardest to get an education but there was all sorts of things that affected that or we tried our hardest to actually enjoy our lives but at the end of it we feel quite dissatisfied we, we try all the time on all these different areas and so we get dissatisfied and then we think that God must be the same and all we're doing again is judging God by the creations in this world that we're in. That's all we're doing. So what we'll do is we'll talk more about the actions that, are required, that faith requires of us after we have a break. Now, Luli, at the beginning you had a question that I said I was going to come back with you with. <laughs> um, about yesterday's discussion. Yeah. Sure. You sure? You're not in the mood anymore. <laughs> Faith is too important. <laughs> Peter, you'd like to ask? I, I've been reading the, the pageant messages for about a year mm -hmm. and I've noticed over and over again um, Paget was told that you know, he, was, he was in this amazing receptive state at certain times and therefore he could connect and, and all this truth came through. Mm -hmm. um, the, there was never much mention about um, expectations. There was never any mention about addictions. There was never any mention really much about emotions or anything. Mm -hmm. And yet he seemed to be able to, well, the impression I got from reading all the messages was he, he, he was receiving all this amazing divine love and he was, um, you know, making this tremendous progress. And even after he passed, he sent messages through saying that, you know, he was in this wonderful place and... What quality of faith did he have that allowed him to do that? Well, firstly, um, there are some things that we don't realise yet that I haven't discussed with you yet about faith and what faith does. If you can think, you remember the spirit world is like spheres or dimensional existences, right? And by the way, Paget passed into the second sphere when he passed. So there's this misconception that he passed at one with God or close to, but... In reality, he passed into the second sphere and was shortly thereafter in the third after he passed. But he had quite a lot to deal with. He was still smoking even when he was on earth. So he had quite a lot of self-love issues to deal with as well. So there's a, there are misconceptions about Paget's condition. Just because you're channeling a high-level spirit, it doesn't mean that you yourself are in a good condition. It just means in that particular moment, you can be in a good condition. So was it, it, was it his quality of faith at that time? Yes. Or was it the amount of prayer that he'd been engaged in? Or both. both. He, he, he had a very, very strong faith. So, 
so strong that actually we brought to him uh, once a week, we brought to him a group of um, spirits in the first sphere and those spirits in the first sphere would be convinced by his faith to actually start connecting to celestial spirits to get help because of Paget's faith. So Paget's faith was very, very strong. It came from his background a lot. He had a background of, Christian, of Christianity. So he had a lot of faith in God, that God exists and that God was good. Right? So these mm -hmm. are very two, two very strong personality feelings, uh, feelings that he had within himself. And while he wasn't very focused on dealing with a lot of his own emotions, we did speak with him on lots of occasions about emotions that he never recorded, about his own condition. We also spoke, if you look at the pageant messages and reread them, and you start, you'll see that all the way through it there is this thing about desire, longing, intentions and aspirations, which are all emotions, are they not? Right. And almost every message that you read has something said about those particular aspects of your emotional state. On top of that, um, whenever you have faith in God, your condition temporarily rises for a period that you have and exercise that faith. We actually describe that to him in the messages themselves. There are some messages that you may recall in the Paget messages that describe this temporary raise of condition. He once asked me how faith healing occurs and I gave him some answers in the messages themselves. And one of the ways that I said is when you long to God for God's love and you have faith that it is going to occur, this raises your condition enough that the actual event can occur. It's not a permanent condition because the permanent condition only results from releasing the underlying causal emotions that create your faith disappearing again afterwards. And this is why many of you have had instances where you've raised your faith and, and you've had moments of clarity. Many of you can remember this, right? Where you have these moments of clarity where everything is just like pristine and clear and, and, and just very firm in your feelings. You know it's true in this moment of clarity. But why does that moment of clarity disappear? Well, it only disappears because it's not a permanent condition yet. It's only going to become a permanent condition when the emotional error that prevents that clarity from existing permanently is removed from your soul. But the beauty of faith is that it raise your, raises your condition temporarily, which enables you, if you think about it, a person in the third sphere or even in the second sphere, it, sitting here on earth, is able to stream in more information into them in a raised condition than they are in their lower condition. And what about divine love? And of course that also applies to divine love. You're able to receive more divine love in that condition. So my understanding was that your soul is a mixture of errors and truth mm -hmm. and assuming that nothing has changed and there's still the same amount of error that there was five minutes or one day or one hour earlier, Yep. then... Um, then I, faith... My, my understanding was that until you remove some of the error, there's no space for the love to flow in. No, but faith creates a temporary condition for new <laughs> truth to enter you. So is it like a balloon being expanded a little bit and then going back to its original shape? Yeah, basically. It, it's a quality that's unique from the soul's perspective. Faith is a quality that makes you open to God. Right? It also is a quality that makes you open to each other when you think about it. If you have faith in another person, you're very open to them and helping you and help getting assistance from them. If you don't have faith in them and you feel critical of them or judgmental of them, right. then you don't listen to them with an open heart, do you? Right? So when you have a, at this quality of faith, it raises your condition temporarily enough for you to actually receive more. So is that how he was able to continually receive divine love? without actually working on his emotions at all? Well, it's not true to say he didn't work on his emotions, Peter. Okay. The, the truth is that it's just not recorded in the messages. Oh, okay. uh, but it, there are indications of it in the messages. If you look at the messages surrounding his daughter's death, for example, when, he, when, he, when his daughter died, his faith was at the lowest. Right? So he had no faith at all. That's neater, is it? That, that's neater. right, yep. And when he had no faith at all, not even his own soulmate could speak with him. For a period of two weeks, she couldn't even speak with him. 
He wouldn't. He refused to even speak with anyone, any of the spirits. But he even refused to speak to his own soulmate. So when you go through a dark emotion, that's the result. You will actually, and you need to go through the dark emotion. And during that two weeks, he went through lots of dark emotions, lots of dark emotions about doubts about us as his spirit friends, lots of dark emotions about soulmate relationship. Lots of dark emotions about whether he was told truth or not all the way up till before then. Lots of, and, he, and he cried a lot because he was so emotional about his daughter's dying. Mm. Does that make sense? Mm. Now, in the process of doing that, he released a lot of emotion, causal emotion. And in the process of releasing the, the causal emotion, what happened was his soulmate could reconnect with him two weeks later and tell him actually she had a lot of difficulty connecting with him up till then because of his emotional condition. And then his daughter connected. And then his daughter connected, mm -hmm. and that increased his faith again. So now, can you see, it went in mm -hmm. cycles for him. Right. right. So he went into the darkness of the emotion, and then he came out of the darkness of the emotion into some light again. And remember, all the way through the messages, we're saying to him, actually, you're not in the space yet where we can give you this message. You're not in the space yet where we can give you this message. Why? because he had yet to deal with a group of emotions or a group of doubts that he had. And his only way of doing that is to have more faith, ask God for more of God's love, and naturally emotions get dealt with in that process. Does that make sense? How many of you have experienced already where you've just had a longing for God's love and you've really felt this longing and all of a sudden you feel God's love entering you and all of a sudden you just burst out crying because it's just entering you and it just feels so emotional? You're releasing a causal emotion then. God's love is already triggering something inside of you. Does that make sense? And that's what's happening. And this was a natural process that, that Paget didn't even understand what was happening and couldn't describe to somebody, mm. but it was happening to him all the time. So he would receive a bit more love and more love. But in the darkest times when his daughter passed, he had, he had no faith. And he had lots of dark doubts and dark emotions and everything. And it took him weeks to get out of that state. He also had times, if you have a look at the pageant message again in, in its whole entirety instead of message by message, you'll see that there were cycles when he spent time with certain people and the spirits told him, look, you need to stop pending, spending time with those people. Mm. Now, why did the spirits say that to him? Because when he spent time with those people, his faith went... And even reading certain books. Yeah, then he went down. Mm. And then when he started reading books, one of the books was that was one of the founders of the Jehovah's Witness faith, right? That we told him, don't read that anymore, right? And the reason why is because it was affecting his faith. It was affecting his belief systems. Right. And, and because of that, it caused a lack of connection. So the connection with the spirit world will ebb and flow based upon what we're dealing with emotionally. However, when we make a permanent shift inside of our soul on an issue, from that moment on, Whatever that shift had caused in terms of damage in our life, that damage can no longer be caused anymore. So after Paget, for example, made the shifts that he made when Nita passed, when his daughter passed, and by the way, for those who don't know, his 18-year-old daughter passed, right? Uh, unexpectedly, in a, in, an, in a little operation, they expected her to live and she died. And the spirits actually had told her, 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 his, own, his own wife had told her before, him beforehand that she would live. So that added to his doubt. And so, and so he went into this very, very dark place, dealt with lots of emotions. And this is a very similar state to what the, the people who were associated with my life in the first century went through when I died. So up until the time I died, very few people were even connected enough to God to receive any divine love, even the people who had followed me for many, many years. But when I died, they were so grief-stricken about my death that it triggered lots and lots of causal emotions in them. And for nearly six weeks, the majority of them spent crying, right? which caused all this stuff to come out of them, all this grief and all this other emotion to come out of them, and it raised their condition permanently. But the beauty of faith is that it can raise your soul condition temporarily. So this ex the extension of faith is how he was able to connect. Yes, um, and obviously faith, you can have lots of faith but also have lots of emotional injuries at the same time. Right? This is the, also the beauty of faith. You don't have to be perfect to have faith. Right? So is this what happens in the, in the Christian churches where 
you go, go along to, you know, one of these Pentecostal meetings and they're all praying for Jesus and yep. they're all, you know, singing and talking in tongues and whatever and, and, and somehow they, they seem to get somewhere. Yes. <laughs> Even though they're not addressing any emotions, they're not, like, they're not they working are. on addictions or they're not working on expectations or any of that stuff. That's correct. And they don't know any, half the things they believe is all back to front and upside down, yep. but they still seem to be getting somewhere. That's right. And the reason why is they are receiving divine love in that moment. I, we can try an experiment of this if you wish. We could choose a song that affects most of you emotionally here and get you all to sing it while we're here, right? And I can guarantee in that particular moment, if that song's about God and you knew the words and everything and you connected with your emotions, that the energy in this entire place would rise temporarily to an entirely different condition. All right? Now, the only problem with that is... It's temporary. <laughs> it's temporary. <laughs> So what happens after you've finished singing it and, and you've cried a bit and whatever else? Some of you might have dealt with some causal emotion, but others maybe not. And so what happens? We go back down to our normal state. Is this why happy pills are so popular? <laughs> it's exactly why. It's also why church is so popular on Sunday. It's exactly the same reason. Because many people go to the church, get that kick, if you like, that emotional kick that raises them to a condition. They feel a sense of inner peace, which is about divine love flowing into them, all of those kind of things. But the rest of the time, they avoid why they're not connected permanently. And what I'm trying to teach you is how to connect permanently, not temporarily, by addiction. So at, so. at those times in the church, though, they, they've had this extension of faith happening to them like Paget was happening. Yes, exactly the same. Exactly the same process and exactly the same effect. And any single person on the planet can do it. You can do it. You can have a time of temporary faith where your faith increases and you can heal somebody even in that state. Yes? In that temporary state, you can. But you'll finish up going back down to your real state until you deal with the underlying emotional condition, the underlying soul condition, which is not just emotions, remember. Mm. It's emotions, desires, passions, morals and all those other aspects of it, which we often ignore. But it's the total condition of the soul that determines where you are most of the time. But it's faith that raises you from that condition to a new location temporarily. And the thing about faith is it makes you feel so good that you start getting, you can actually start getting addicted to just trying to get the faith rather than actually dealing with the reason why you're not in a state of permanent faith or permanent uh, set, set of Is that like spiritual alcoholism? It, it is, yeah. Yeah, it is exactly that. We're high on the spirit man, you know? Like, yeah, it's, it's exactly that. And there are literally thousands and thousands of Pentecostal churches that live off of that, that temporary creation mm. of that temporary state. Mm. Right? And there's no harm in it except the harm of when they get bound down to the normal state, are they learning how to face their life in a permanent way that can raise their state permanently to that condition? And the answer there is, most of the time, no. But isn't that because they don't actually understand how to do that? No, it's not. It's, because, it's not just because they don't understand how to do it. It's because a lot of times they don't want to. Okay. Right? Because, because, because what am I addicted to most of the time on the planet? I'm addicted to feeling good. And any time I feel bad, what do I do with my emotions? I distract myself from them and get out of them. Do I not? Yeah. Right? Most people in Christian religions do exactly this. So in other words... They go along to church, they have a lovely singing session. Oh, the download of divine love is happening. You've got all these celestial spirits around them and all this is actually happening. We've got all these celestial... It's wonderful. You go along to one, you'll feel the, it's wonderful in that moment. You sit down to listen to the preacher tell, talk his talk, right? So you sit down and you're listening to the preacher and he starts talking about the wrath of God. <laughs> What's just happened? <laughs> What's just happened is all of a sudden we've gone from this beautiful place of truth and love and, and download of divine love into the soul. Now my soul's getting crushed by a teaching that, uh, that it is false. And my soul even knows it. Right at the moment my soul feels its own self being shrunk by what's being stated to it. 
So you get this fire and brimstone preacher. He's out there hammering at how bad you are and bad this and bad this and you're sinners and you've got to do repent and da, 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 and off he goes and, and you're just going, uh, you know, inside of your soul. Like you're just shrinking. And then all of a sudden he gets off. You beauty, we clap because he's got off now. <laughs> and, <laughs> which is half the reason why you clap when I get off anyway. But <laughs> And then, so we, that's why we get up. And then we start to sing again, and all of a sudden, again, that same download, you know, that same feeling, that same passion is there in my, relation, my personal relationship with God. And unfortunately, they can feel it, but they don't then translate that into their logic. So they can feel, right? There was this high part then when I sang the song. And when I was, de- and I was praying, it was really high, I felt really good. And then the preacher talked and I felt really low. And then when he talked about hellfire, I went down here. And then, and then when it got to the end and he said, oh, let's sing some songs. And there were some really nice songs about God's love. <laughs> and I was up here. And, and, I, and I don't go back over and go, hmm, <laughs> high, low, high, low. And then say, when was I high? That was down that condition. We don't use any logic, you see, do we? Most of the time, we don't use any logic at all. What we do is we look at the whole thing and say, oh, it was an okay experience and there was moments when I felt fantastic. Instead of saying, hey, let's look at the moment when I felt fantastic. What do I learn from that? And let's look at the moment when I felt terrible. What's God telling me there? God's telling me huge things there in that process. So they're getting told every single Sunday they go to church what's really the truth. What part is connecting them to God and what part isn't? And yet ignoring that. Right? And they're ignoring that because if I leave this religion, you know, my friends might not love me anymore. I'm ignoring it for all sorts of emotional reasons inside of myself. Does that make sense? And that's why they ignore it. So is, is faith happening on all different levels then? I mean, you're saying if, if there's no action, then, then there's no faith. So it must be happening at a physical <laughs> level. And it must be happening at a mental level because there's like a, a desire there or a, a decision and it must be happening at a soul level as well. So, well, in the end, Peter, everything comes from the soul. Right. But but there are emotions that influence what we do with that information coming from the soul that are also coming from the soul. So so I can at the same time be longing for God's love to enter me and singing at the top of my voice because I just love the feeling of that and be receiving divine love. And then a moment later, just one moment later. I can be in a total different condition because of an emotion of approval for, with the minister. A moment later, I can say, instead of saying, hey, minister, minister, uh, can I just say something? You know how you talk about God being a God of uh, punishment? Well, that, that doesn't sit with me. And, he's, and what will he say? You're about the Bible and off you go. You know what I mean? Like, so, so, you know, there'd be lots of criticism about that because of your statement. But, but you see... I'm now emotionally hooked into, so I, so I love the high, but I'm also emotionally hooked into the fact that I want his approval. So that's my low. My low is because of my own emotion. And actually what happened throughout the entire service tells me exactly, inside of myself, it tells me exactly what the truth is. But unfortunately, I don't want to acknowledge that because acknowledging that might mean that I may have to leave the highs because this thing doesn't feel good all the time, or I may have to, my whole family may be in it, and there might be such a thing called excommunication in this church, whenever you say that, you know, God's not a punishing God, or, you know, some other such, uh, Jesus isn't God, by the way, and the Holy Spirit isn't God, and all these other things that you want to say that you don't feel inside of yourself, you, you feel quite differently about, everyone will attack you, everyone, and maybe even excommunicate you. So, so what's driving you to not do that and live in truth there? Your own emotions. And that's the low. So the high is your faith in God, your love for God, your desire for God, the feeling for God, your singing about God. And then as soon as he starts talking, the minister starts talking about all these untruths, then you go into your lows. Your lows are, why am I addicted to this minister? Why, what, what's going on inside of me there? Why can't I speak the truth? I don't feel what he's saying to me. I feel like the opposite does that. Why can't I speak up? Why can't... And all that. And there's my low. There's my stuff that I'm not dealing with. And that's inhibiting my relationship with God. So yes, the truth is that the majority of people who are in Pentecostal Christian religion space who enter this place of, of deep desire for God are receiving divine love at that moment. 
And at that moment, while they're singing and dancing and feeling those feelings, there are often literally thousands of celestial spirits with them, helping them, praying for them to receive more love. And it's a beautiful thing. But unfortunately, what we finish up doing is we don't look at the entire thing of when we were high, when we were low, when we were high, when we were low, and look at the lows and see the emotional addiction that we have there and release it. We don't do that. What we do is we ignore all of that because we don't have any faith that we can actually be closer to God than we currently are. In the end, that's why we ignore it. You see, see if I had some faith that I could have a permanent relationship of bliss with God and not just this temporarily Sunday-based one which goes in cycles all the way through a sermon and I actually believed that there was a reason why this relationship with God was cycling like this and I actually started focusing on looking at when I'm high and looking at when I'm low and examining the emotional reasons within myself which I, by the way, feel at the time, most of the time and if I looked at all of that, I'd be able to, I'd be able to create a permanent space where I'm high on God's love. And even higher again if I release even more and even higher again if I release even more because it makes sense that God, if God is infinite then love is infinite and so forth. So, so the problem that most people on the planet face is that we tend to blind ourselves to the truth that's being presented to us at every single moment. The truth that's being presented to us every single moment is that we have times of high, times of low, times of high, times of low. In the times of low, there's an emotional cause. If we release the emotional cause, that low, that particular low doesn't need to happen anymore. Right? And then we could have every single Pentecostal church in the country and on the planet in a space, the entire sermon, in a space where they're hearing truth 100% of the time. So you've seen a calibration, I think, I think John, John and, and um, Joy, sorry Joy, John and Joy have calibrated a lot of these talks, at like 14 or 1500 or whatever on the Hawkins scale of calibration of, of truth. You imagine that every single Pentecostal church that you ever could go to had a permanent calibration at that level. And on top of that, everyone's singing and dancing and how do you come away feeling then? Uh, and that's what's possible. But th the thing that seems to be stopping it is that belief that the Bible is the word of God and that's set in concrete. Well, remember how I started this discussion, how I said our beliefs have to be confronted, our morals have to be confronted. And the things that are stopping it are morals, beliefs, all of these falsehoods that interfere. So the truth is that Paget had some of those going on too, mm -hmm. right? all the way through, and it's evident all the way through the Paget messages. And it's evident all the way through that he had periods where his faith was high, periods where his faith was low. Obviously, when his faith was low, he had to deal with emotions before his faith could get up again. But that's not quite as obvious when you read the messages. But when we talk about the feelings associated, you can see all the way through the messages, it's all about feelings, aspirations, inspiration, desire, passion, longing. Those words are used all the time. I think the word passion is used about a hundred times. And so do all those mixed together to make up like a cocktail which is called faith. Exactly. And, and, but faith being the assured expectation that if we stay in this place where we trust God all the time and we trust that we can become at one with God, at, all, at any moment one of us could become at one with God and that we know that we're on the path to do that just because we can feel our connection with God growing, then, of course, we're in a state where faith raises us to this level where we're willing to act and we're willing to do things harmonious with truth and love automatically. How much faith does it require, do you think, to, to, to be able to stand in an arena with 10,000 people looking at you, 10,000 people looking at you, and a lion coming towards you to eat you and yet you can be there completely calmly. Well, that's how many of your Christian brothers and sisters from near the first century and second centuries of our period of time, they had that experience. Many of them were burnt alive. You imagine, can you imagine, hanging on a, on a stick, right, with a fire underneath you ready to be lit 
and thousands of people watching you burn and cheering and yet you still are peaceful about that. That's faith. And faith, you've got to have some pretty sure things going on inside of yourself, don't you, to have that faith. And that's the kind of faith that we want. So I'm going to have a break now because otherwise I'll keep talking and, and, uh, and we'll talk more about the personal effects of faith on our life.